it was in the late 90s. I, I can't quite remember the exact year, actually. Um, but I was dating a guy who had a birthday that was a day before mine. So every year we would kind of go do something for our birthdays. And we um, didn't know what to do that particular year. So we decided to go away to a small town. Where? <laughs> the town, um, it's a small town in Northern California called Etna. And we, neither of us had ever actually been there before. So we were pretty excited to go check it out. Um, I grew up in a really small town. So I always kind of am drawn to vacation in small places. So you're just going to go there. You didn't know anything about it, but you thought it'd be fine. You just get away for a couple of days. Yeah. I mean, you know, we looked at the town and it was really cute. And we thought we'd go hiking and things like that. So Erin Peters and her boyfriend made a reservation at a little bed and breakfast in Etna. I can't even remember how we found it because, you know, you didn't really go online in 1997. So... How did we find places in 19... I can't even... How did we find places? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I, I don't know. I assumed that we went online and then I was no, like, I don't, I don't even... I don't know. Yeah. Find <laughs> Would you call like the Chamber of Commerce? I can't... Probably. Figure out how you okay, so you found a place. Yeah, I mean, I may have asked my family for a recommendation. I can't even remember. So somehow I found this bed and breakfast. And as, as far as I know, it was one of the few places you could actually stay in the town. There's no motel or hotel or anything like that. So what did you do when you arrive at the bed and breakfast? Um, I think that we fell asleep for a while because we were both kind of exhausted. And then um, we got up and I remember, you know, having a glass of wine and there was no one else staying there. Will you describe, I mean, we the, the bed and breakfast a little bit, what it looked like, what your room was like? It was a pretty old building. Um, we stayed in, I, I'm sure it was probably the least expensive room that they had. Um, but, you know, you're kind of your typical bed and breakfast with probably six to eight rooms in it total, maybe even less. So you met the owner. She was nice and pleasant and helpful. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was very friendly um, and happy to give us, like, suggestions on where to eat. And she was basically like, there, there's one restaurant that's open in town. So we walked down there. But when Erin Peters and her boyfriend got to the restaurant, it had just closed. So there they were, in this tiny town on their birthdays, and they couldn't find anything to eat. But they decided they would try to make the best of it. At least they were in a pretty place. They wandered around and took a lot of pictures. This was the late 90s, so Erin and her boyfriend were shooting on film. Yeah, lots of pictures of the town. There are some really beautiful mountains um, right nearby, um, and you can go hiking around there, and it's really beautiful. You get back to the bed and breakfast, hungry, and you just you go to sleep. How, how did you sleep that night? Um, I think we slept fine. In fact, I remember she had a video collection, um, so we watched a movie, and I don't remember seeing her when we returned. Um, and I remember it, we watched that movie about, um, it's basically about the Clintons, I think Primary Colors, I think that might be the name of it. And then we went to bed after that. And what was the next morning like? She made breakfast that was, you know, just like some fruit and stuff like that. Um, I remember she had pictures of um, her and her husband um, all over kind of like the kitchen area and where we were eating. And she talked about her husband a little bit who had passed away. Um, and they seen, it, you know, really sweet pictures of them together. And were you just there for one night? Yeah. You know, I was trying to remember. I think it was just one night. So what happened when you got home? Um. So we got home and, and, you know, I'm sure a few days passed or some time passed. And then um, I had taken the film in to develop. Um, and I don't know if I waited and there were a couple roles or if it was just that role. But when I um, went to pick up the prints, it takes a few days or whatever. And um, immediately you look through, like I remember oh, every time I would take photos you flip through the prints, like, immediately. You know, you're always really excited, usually, like, sitting in your car, you know. And um, I was flipping through, and partway in, there's a picture um, of my boyfriend and I just kind of in our— we were in our clothes, like, on the outside of the bed, you know, like, just kind of had fallen asleep. And um, 
I looked at it and we were both very clearly asleep. Um, and I immediately was like, well, how could we both be asleep? Like, this is so strange. Like, did he, ha you know, did he happen to take this picture? And, you know, so I'm looking at it really closely. Um, and you can just tell by, you know, like our eyes and the way our bodies were that we were totally out. I mean, really asleep. Um, so then, you know, I kind of freaked out and I was just like, how could this happen? And so I, um, called my boyfriend. I either called him or, you know, I, the, you know, that evening when I saw him, I can't remember. And I showed it to him and I was like, we're both asleep. And he was kind of like, yeah, that's weird. And I was like, well, how'd the picture get taken? You know, and he, um, he was like, oh yeah, that's kind of creepy. And I was like, well, you know, someone else had to take this picture. And he wasn't nearly as, I think, disturbed as I was. Um, and then, of course, the more I started thinking about it, the more I, I just wondered how it happened um, and who it could have been. Um, Did your camera have a timer on it at all that could have? Um, like, it, I, not that I ever used. I mean, it may, I'm sure it must have. I was just thinking about um, whether your boyfriend could have done it. But yeah, now. I mean, he could have. Well, no, I mean, he could have. He certainly denied doing it. And he really looked asleep. That was the thing that kind of threw me off. I thought it could have been like, oh, yeah, he did, you know, like, just took a picture and it was funny and he thought it was cute. Um, but he was really asleep. You know, like, it wasn't just me. Like, I knew I was asleep. And he is very clearly asleep as well. And it's also just like the angle, the way it was taken. It doesn't look... Um, it's just like an odd angle, you know? Like you can really see the top half of our bodies like laying in this bed completely asleep. What were the different <sighs> sc scenarios that were running through your head? Oh, I don't know. I mean, at first I just, I, you know, I, that there was maybe other, there were other people that were guests there. Um, but there weren't. I, no, there were no other guests. Um, so then I was just really freaked out. Um and, you know, I think I came to the conclusion that, it, I mean, I think, I guess that it may have been her. And I, I think I remember even saying to him, like, she was so nice. You know, she seemed very normal, very normal. And um, so I thought, oh, wow, what a, you know, I don't know. And I guess I thought I would never know what happened. Um, I can't, it, that's like a horror movie. Well, I think the weirdest part to me, too, was that, Somebody knowingly did it th with your own camera. Like, knowing that you would go home and sometime later discover that they were in your room. I mean, the, the fact that, like, you intentionally, like, are going to get caught in a way. You know? Oh, man. So what did you do? Did you call the woman? No, I didn't. You know, I didn't really do anything. I, I think that I thought maybe briefly about who I could call. Like, could you call the sheriff or could you call somebody? Um, but then I was like, what would I say? And, you know, what What do I have to prove? But, like, all you can see is, like, the quilt of the bed, you know, and maybe, like, part of the bed frame. So how could you even prove that anybody did anything wrong, you know? Like, it just doesn't really seem like a believable story. <laughs> I have never liked bed and breakfasts. I refuse to stay in them because it's for me. It's just this kind of it's like this forced intimacy, and mm -hmm. it's so personal. And so when you wake up in the morning, like I never want the breakfast. I don't yeah. want a woman making breakfast for me. I want it to be so impersonal. It feels like I'm in their kitchen, but I don't know yeah. them. And you have to go help yourself to get the orange juice. Oh, oh yeah, it's really gosh. and see all the other stuff in their house. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's really personal. And, you know, that's the thing. I'm sure we didn't lock the door. Um, you know, it, it's very, like, the whole house is wide open. It's not like I was nervous about my well-being. That was kind of it. Erin saved the photos, but she tried to forget about it. Years later, she went to a San Francisco Giants game with a friend from high school and her friend's fiancé, Steve. We're sitting there, and it's the first time I had met him. And um, he's talking about himself. And I was like, well, Steve, where are you from? And he was like, oh, I'm from Etna. And I just completely kind of froze. And I was like, you're from Etna? And 
he was like, yeah, why? And I was like, oh, I, um, I stayed at this bed and breakfast and the weirdest thing happened. And he didn't even need to hear any more of the story. He was like, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And um, the woman was busted and doesn't, you know, no longer has this bed and breakfast. She's and I was other like, other people? Well, I, according to according to this, um, you know, to my friend's uh, fiance, yeah, and that she had gotten caught. And I asked him a couple more questions, but you know, we were at a baseball game, so I didn't, I didn't find out too much. But it was just a trip, and you know, then of course I, after the fact, had lots of questions, like how did she get caught, and how many years had she been doing this? Oh, and then I started thinking about, um, did she used to do this with her husband? They had run this place together for years. Like, how long has this been going on? I mean, maybe she yeah, thought she was know. giving you a nice memory or something? Yeah, that's a nice way to think about it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's so scary. I, I, I don't know. I guess I would have to assume that there was the, the, maybe the idea or the thrill of kind of freaking someone out a little bit. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's why she did it. I really have no idea. I was hoping you guys could figure that out. <laughs> we made some calls. One guy said, there used to be an old inn in a big Victorian house. It's since burned down. The locals nicknamed it the Peekaboo Inn because the owner would spy on his guests through holes he drilled in the walls. Maybe that's what Aaron's friend Steve was thinking about. But... We didn't find a single thing about it in the newspaper archives. We tried the Aetna Police Department. They did not return our call. Maybe one day we'll take a trip out there and try to finish the story. We did happen to stumble across a 2011 guide to owning and operating a bed and breakfast. In a section about thank you notes, it says, Some hosts like to take a photograph of each guest at some point during the visit and mail it as a memento. It goes on to say, This is a great idea, provided that the timing and occasion of taking the picture are appropriate. Aaron Peters got in touch with us a few months ago, after we spoke with a woman named Amber Dawn. The first night I moved in, you know, I had... I had been playing music while I was unpacking, and I went to bed that night, and I turned off the music, and I was laying in my bed, and I heard footsteps in the attic, and they were very clear footsteps. If you miss that one, it's called A Bump in the Night. At the end of the episode, we asked you to get in touch if something unusual like that had ever happened to you. A lot of people wrote to us. So, today, for our last episode of 2017, here are the ones we couldn't stop thinking about. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. Uh, One morning, me and Brett had woken up for band practice really early and MJ woke up for football practice and we were walking around the house and noticed that somebody had opened up all of the cupboards and drawers and the microwave door and the oven door and shower stall doors and everything. The refrigerator, the dishwasher, the dryer, the washer, everything was open. What do you mean you woke up in the morning and it was all open or... Yeah, we all had just gone to bed after like a normal night and then woke up in the morning and everything was open. Yeah, everything was just left wide open as if a ghost had come through the house and blown everything open or something. We weren't sure how to explain it. In their senior year of college at Ohio State, Mark Hartman and Brett McGlynn moved into a huge house with a lot of their friends, 10 of them. But Mark, Brett, and their friend MJ got there a little before everyone else because they had to start training for marching band and football. They'd only been there for a few days when they woke up to find everything opened up. But even before that, the house was apparently just bad. Here's Mark. Oh, it was terrible. Uh, We moved in, and it was as if uh, no one had ever been in the house since the last tenants moved out. There was 
trash everywhere and everything was still dirty and there was furniture and some electrical problems and some uh, stairs in the house were falling apart and things like that. It was a very large house. Um, I mean, on our lease, there are 10 of us and we took up the second and the third floor. There was a completely separate lease though um, on the first floor and there was no actual physical separation between our leases. There was like a staircase that would go down to like a door that just w- walked out of the house. Um, and you could get to any floor from there, including the basement. Okay, so it was just three of you in this big house at this point. At this point in time, yeah. Did you ever think that one of the other people was playing a trick on you? Yeah, honestly, uh, Brett had sleptwalked a few times throughout college, so I kind of assumed maybe he had just sleptwalked and done some something random like that. But I was on the third floor of the house, and it seemed a pretty impressive feat for me to sleepwalk down a flight of stairs, open up everything, and then walk back upstairs without hurting myself. So it didn't seem like it was really what happened. What did you do? I mean, I think that I would be really scared. I think I would try to get out of the house. What did you do? We decide to go and investigate the house. We each grabbed, you know, a baseball bat or something, and we were going through all the rooms and opening the closets. And So all of you had a baseball bat? Yeah, or a baseball bat or a knife or a something. Like, one of us would hold the closet, and then the other one would have, like, a baseball bat ready to, like, jump at anything that, like, came out of the closet. We would kind of, like, open the doors quickly as if we were a SWAT team or something. <laughs> yeah, basically breach and clear uh and other than just like the house being dirty um we didn't really find anything until we went to the basement oh yeah we definitely saved that for last <laughs> so when we went down there um i mean it's very dark in the basement uh it was like a different like uh boilers and breakers and whatnot uh but there's also a door down there and there was a door that none of us had the key to. And MJ started freaking out. So what we ended up doing is just we propped up a, uh, a, a, a door that was lying around in the basement. We propped it up in the open uh, doorway that led down to the basement and put a wedged a chair between it and the door so that whatever was down there wouldn't come back up. <laughs> so it's... It's like if, in case there was like a like a monster or like a bad guy, you, this would help. This would save you all. Yeah, yeah. It, I guess that's what we did to try to make ourselves feel safe. I would get worried that I'd be happy that I had barricaded the door, but I also think I'd be worried that if someone were in there, I would be starving them to death. Exactly, and that was kind of some of my motivation to take down that uh, the chair wedge between the wall and the door that we had. I was like, in case he was down there, I didn't want, didn't want to trap someone down there, you know. Or make them even more mad. Exactly. So after that initial search, did you, did you go back down into the basement? Often. So I lived on the third floor. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if it was faulty wiring or, you know, a bad breaker or something, but like a... Every, like, like three or four times a week, like, just all the power in my room would just shut off. And I'd have to, like, go down to the basement, flip the breaker, and then the power would be back on my room. So one of those times that I had to go flip the breaker, um, it just so happened that that door was open. I was kind of shocked. Like, uh, so I, like, walked downstairs, looked into the door and it was just the normal bedroom. Like it had mattress and dresser and, you know, the, a normal college looking room. And then uh, from the bathroom, somebody said, or a guy said like, oh, I was wondering when I get to meet the people that live here. <laughs> and it was just uh, like, a, like a regular college student. And when, you, was he just kind of casual about it all and nonchalant and like, oh, hi. Yeah, basically it was like, you know, completely non-threatening. And um, later that day, a bunch of us were 
hanging out and Brett's talking to the downstairs roommates and, and says, hey, I met your guy's uh, roommate, Jeremy, today. And they were like, we don't have a roommate named Jeremy. He's like, yeah, he's the, he's the one down in the basement. No one had ever heard of anyone named Jeremy. So they called their landlord, who called the police. I come home from practice one day, and there are police and landlords and all my roommates out on the lawn. It's a very chaotic scene. Now, uh, I don't think the guy was actually downstairs when the police came. So, like, I don't actually know what happened to him. I'm honestly not sure. I came home, and he wasn't home when they knocked his door down. And uh, then a couple of days later, I went down, and all the stuff was gone. I never saw him again. Who was this guy? Um, he was just a student going for a master's degree at Ohio State. The school newspaper, The Lantern, wrote up the incident, and they made a video. What they found shocked everyone. A bedroom that someone else had been living in. No, what? Like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> Jeremy had access to a bathroom in the basement and a sink that he could have used to do laundry. But the guys don't think he ever ate their food or went into their rooms. Chelsea Spears for The Lantern. Did you feel a little famous? Oh, I did. It, it was crazy <laughs> how, much it, how much it blew up. Um, we, got, we had articles on... USA Today, uh, ABC headquarters in New York called me, did an interview. Uh, Jay Leno talked about us in his monologue. Steve Harvey contacted me asking asking if we wanted to go on his show. It was pretty crazy. Did you do any of these things? I did a few of them. I didn't I didn't physically go anywhere. Like I think Steve Harvey's thing would have required us to fly to Chicago. So uh, I did a couple of phone interviews and things like that. But Mark and Brett graduated and moved out of that big house. The one thing that always bothered me about that whole sequence of events is we never really figured out who went around opening up all those cabinets. But years later, I'm working at a startup, and eventually the people at the startup, like, you know, find out about this story, and so, like, you know, people are talking about it. And one of the people I'm working with comes up to me and starts to talk to me about the story. And, you know, this random coworker of mine told me it was him. He was the one that opened up all those cabinets. He had lived in the house the year before us. And the guy that was in the basement was a cousin of one of the people that was on their lease. And they had made some kind of arrangement with him that he would pay them a little bit of money in order to live in that room in the basement. After they had left their lease, that guy decided to keep his key, and then he would, like, periodically come in and then just kind of, like, screw with the people living in the house, you know, opening cabinets and, like, other things like that. But I guess they had never told the basement roommate that they were leaving, although how you could not tell that everybody had left, you know, is beyond me. So probably the guy in the basement just decided to stay there as long as he could because, you know, you're living there for free, essentially. Because he could just sneak in in that side entrance and go straight to the basement without ever being seen by anyone, basically. I mean, it's awful. It, it is awful to think that, you know, when you go to a place, it's like, okay, well, the last people are gone. It's safe for me. It's crazy to think that someone else would have the keys to the house that you just moved into. Yeah, that's it's pretty creepy. Like, I mean, it wasn't just, like, the guy in the basement. It was also that co-worker of mine he also had keys and I have to assume that it wasn't just him that also had keys I wonder how many landlords never actually change the locks who knows hello hello I'm looking for Amanda hi this is you hello it's Phoebe Judge calling are you in Texas? I am in Texas. I'm in Austin. Well, thanks very much for speaking with us and for writing in about your story. Of course. Um, I thought it was an interesting story that y'all had done. And um, at the end of it, I was like, oh, well, yeah, something like that kind of happened to me. And um, I honestly, I wasn't really expecting an email back. So 
Well, here we are. It was really cool to get that. Here we are. Uh, So just again, introduce yourself, will you? Um, My name's Amanda. Um, I grew up in a really small town, and I came to Austin um, for school. I went to St. Edwards University. So you grew up in a small town in Texas? Mm -hmm. It's called Yoakum. It's uh, about an hour and a half southeast-ish of Austin. So when you left and came to Austin, was Austin kind of like a big, it must be a big city compared to Yoakum? Oh, yes, very much so. Um, Yoakum has got, I think, 5,000 people, roughly. And what car were you driving then? Um, I drive the same car now. It's a 2005 uh, silver Chevy Cobalt. Okay. I'm thinking about this car. It, Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a lot of... It's not that ostentatious. It's not that fancy. It's it's just a, it's a not car. It's a simple, it's good car. A, they're a dime a dozen. Like you see them all the time. It's it's my that's been my first car that I've ever had that I'm still driving. Um, but I don't have the original key um, to the car, and because I just have a copy, anytime I lock my door, and I don't have a clicker anymore, so anytime I lock my door. Uh, I have to put the key in to unlock it, and because it's not the original key, it just there's this alarm that goes off every single time, and it doesn't stop until I start the ignition. She says this alarm is horrible, and she hates it, so she just doesn't lock the car. And leaving it unlocked isn't a big deal. For one, she says she never leaves anything of value in her car. She says that if she did have something worth stealing, she'd rather someone just open the door to take it better than breaking a window. And she never had any issues. She'd been in Austin for a couple of years, never locking the car and never having any trouble, until one morning when she was a junior in college. It had rained really um, pretty heavily the night before. And I went out into my car, and I noticed that my seat was pushed all the way back. And I kind of thought it was odd, but I was like, well, you know, maybe I just did this and I forgot that I had done this. Um, and I was probably running late to class already. So I kind of just brushed it off. Um, and it continued to rain kind of heavy that day and into the next day and overnight. And that's when I noticed it a second time. It was the second day, um, that my seat had been pushed back and just down all the way down. And that's when I was like, Oh, Somebody slept in here. Okay. You're just like, okay. You said, yeah. okay. Okay. You know, there's not anything I could do other than lock my car. Um, but I guess in the back of my mind, I thought, oh, well, this is a creative way to not, you know, sleep in the rain and stay out of the rain. So um, I just kind of let it go. And it was something that continued to happen. And that was just kind of our little system. <laughs> Did you notice any other strange things? Was it in the car? No. Um, so occasionally I would get, um, I'd be given a little gift. Uh, so there were some bushes that would bloom near uh, next to my apartment. And occasionally there would be a flower there. Um, one time they left me a little bit of change. Um, And my senior year, they left me a little ring that you would get, like, out of a coin machine. Um, But nothing was ever taken from my car um, or really moved other than my seat. Uh, There was another time that my work sweater that had been in the back, because I kind of just took it off and threw it in the back, um, was actually up in the front seat. And... That one was, I think, the only time that they actually used anything of mine. And I remember thinking, oh, well, it was really cold last night. So, Do you yeah. think that you're the nicest person on earth? <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm definitely, I'm definitely not. Definitely not. Because um, I'll tell you, I think I would have locked that door after about night two. <laughs> that's fair. Um, and it's something I, I mean, I locked my car occasionally but I mean even still, like even right now it's, I know for a fact it's not locked <laughs> and they were leaving you little thank you gifts 
Yeah, never um, any actual interaction. And that was the, the interesting thing is that over this like year and a half, almost two year long period, we never ran into each other. We never saw each other. Um, that was just kind of our little system was I'll leave my car open and you can sleep here. And if, I mean, you don't have to leave anything, but occasionally they would. And that was it. And that was our system for two years. And we just don't talk. So I get it. And and I think I get you park the car. You don't need it. But what ha- would happen if you in the middle of the night got sick and thought, I have to go and I have to get some Tylenol. I have to go. I mean, would it? Then what would that keep you from going? I like I don't want to wake them up and they're in the middle of their their sleep. <laughs> um, I don't know that I, that that never it never really occurred to me. Like what what that? <laughs> I guess if it were raining, I'd probably make one of my roommates come with me, and you know, be like, yeah, I, I got to use my car right now. You got to go, buddy. <laughs> so this was you think this was only happening when it was raining. Yeah, it would only happen when it would rain, and it would have to rain um, fairly heavily, so not too, too often, but often enough that (laughs) they knew where to find my car, and they (laughs) knew it was open. After graduation, Amanda went to Cambodia to teach English for a year, so she was gone, and her car wasn't in its usual spot in her apartment complex. I did think about that um, at the end of my senior year uh, when I was moving that, um, like, I, I was like, well, where are they going to, where are they going to sleep now? Hopefully they can find another place that's safe. You know, it's funny. Everybody is so afraid of everything lately. And I'm so afraid of everyone else. Mm-hmm. But uh, this is a good reminder. We don't have to be. Yeah, I mean, all they needed was a little bit of shelter. And if I can provide that in a really small way, then yeah, why not? Thanks to everyone who wrote to us with mysterious stories from their lives. Hearing from you is one of the best parts of the job. We'll be back in January with brand new criminal stories. And we're excited to announce that we're also working on a little side project that has nothing to do with crime. We'll tell you more about it in the new year. Thanks so much for listening and supporting us. It means an awful lot. Criminal is produced by Lauren Spohr, Nadia Wilson, and me. Audio mixed by Rob Byers. Our intern is Matilde Urfelino. Julian Alexander makes original illustrations for each episode of Criminal. You can see them at thisiscriminal.com. We're on Facebook and Twitter at Criminal Show. Criminal is recorded in the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. We're a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collection of the best podcasts around. And thanks to AdZerk for providing their ad-serving platform to Radiotopia. Until next year. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. Radiotopia. Radiotopia.